Tim Flannery, welcome to The Elephant. Thank you very much. So this is a, a series that we're doing that's looking at climate change and looking at different facets of the issue. We're going to be exploring everything from, from the international politics to the to oceans rising to the, the debate over pipelines in North America. But with you, before we get into the specifics uh, in later episodes, I, I kind of want to get a, a state of the planet. And I was wondering if someone, say, fell asleep uh, in 1997 and woke up today uh, and it was your job to characterize kind of the, the moment we're in with climate change, how, how would you describe uh, this time, that this year that, that we find ourselves in? Well, look, if someone had fallen asleep in 1997 and uh, awoken in uh, 2015, they'd be waking up in a year of real decision-making, sort of the last moment of decision-making, I think, in terms of the global climate issue that we have available to us. In 1997, you had to be a scientist or someone, you know, aware of the issue, uh, someone rather unusual, perhaps, to be uh, to, to, to understand that there was a climate problem. By 2015, everyone on the planet knows there's a problem. Uh, the big question on everybody's lips is whether we're going to fix it or not. And would you tell this person, like, in terms of who's winning the game? Is it, is it looking good? Well, what I'd say to someone who'd just woken up and uh, they'd ask me, how's it going with climate change? I'd say, the coin's been tossed, it's spinning in the air. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to come up heads or tails, but we will know soon. Uh, basically, what's happened is that over the last decade, we've been uh, experiencing the worst case scenario for carbon pollution. So as bad as it gets in any of the projections that scientists have done. And that's left us with an enormous overhanging problem and with no choice now but to put the brakes on really hard to cut emissions harder than anyone thought we could. Uh, and even then, in a couple of decades' time, we'll probably be scrambling to uh, find technologies and means of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere because even with our best efforts, it's likely we're going to overshoot the safety margin uh, uh, of the climate system. You, you've called this the, the critical decade. Can you explain some of the, the numbers behind the, the reasoning, why this is the important time? Yeah. Look, um, in terms of this being the critical decade, um, what we've seen is a, a build up, a massive increase in the amount of carbon pollution and greenhouse gas pollution that's going into the atmosphere annually. So in 2014, the volume was thought to be about 44 gigatons of CO2 pollution. And then you've got to count the other greenhouse gases and probably takes you up above 50 gigatons. Um, an easy thing to say, but hard to conceptualise what that is. Uh, if we think about a gigaton, it's a number with nine zeros after it. And to put it in a planetary context, a gigaton of carbon is really a planet-altering thing. Uh, if, and just to explain that, you know, we can think about wanting to plant enough forests, for example, to draw that amount of carbon uh, out of the atmosphere. Um, you'd, you'd need to be planting overall, you know, an area the size of Australia probably to do that uh, over a 50-year period and planting an area the size of the UK um, every year uh, to achieve that sort of outcome. So they're, they're very, very big numbers. And, and the, in terms of staying under two degrees, can you talk a bit about that? Why is two degrees matter? Um, how did this, this number get, get decided on? Well, the two degree number um, seems to have got made almost in the absence of thought. It, it was made uh, really as a result of scientists a couple of decades ago identifying increasing risk above two degrees um, and then it becoming adopted by politicians as the threshold we shouldn't cross. Um, but with that much sort thought as to how much carbon need would have to go into the atmosphere to take us above two degrees. Um, what we're seeing now with modern science and a better understanding of the Earth system is that even at one degree or one and a half degrees of warming, we're going to be living in a very different world. Uh, where at the moment, temperatures are up about 0 0.8 of a degree above the pre-industrial average, and that's been enough to cause huge melting of the Greenland ice cap and threaten the Arctic ice cap. 
and cause a meltdown of the glaciers of West Antarctica, which is in progress now. Um, a world that's one and a half degrees warmer than the baseline, the pre-industrial average, uh, wouldn't have a barrier reef, a Great Barrier Reef, for example. Most coral reefs are going to be under severe threat. Uh, some of the world's great coastal wetlands uh, will be inundated, as well as the world's uh, coastal cities. Uh, so, you know, there's serious consequences even before you reach two degrees. It's just that once you go beyond two degrees, things get more and more catastrophic. You know, I'm, I'm curious because uh, one of the strange things about climate change is it's kind of like, a, you know, you could say it's a, like a, a sports team rooting, uh, will, we, will we solve climate change or not? Like the battle between these two, two forces, but it's one with a million moving parts. And so it's kind of hard to wrap your, your head around like how we're actually doing. One of the things I'm, I'd be curious to, to hear uh, your thoughts on is where we're at politically right now. Um, cause it seems in some countries like, like Australia and Canada, um, it, it's been going backwards with the repeal of, of carbon tax and, uh, and, and quite conservative governments. And the other hand, there's, there's quite positive steps in, in some other countries. H- how would you characterize the overall political situation? Well, the political situation as of 2015 is really very different, uh, from what it was in 2009, which was the last time we really had a global effort at solving the climate problem. Um, Back then, uh, a lot of the technologies that we needed to solve the problem were economically immature. Uh, I guess the threat from those who wanted to change, you know, in the eyes of the fossil fuel lobby wasn't quite as serious. Uh, Whereas this time around, what we're seeing is the fossil fuel industries fighting for life. They really are. Um, and they're fighting for life because the technologies that challenges challenge them have matured and are now really cost competitive in an open marketplace, many of them. Um, and, and just as a testimony to that, you know, for the last two years running, the, the world has installed more clean energy technology than it has fossil fuel based technology. So that's a fundamental shift that's happened. Uh, things like um, disinvestment campaigns are threatening the fossil fuel industry. Um, uh, they're getting more and more pushback with uh, major developments. Uh, There's less and less profit in those industries for them. Um, They seem to have a huge carbon liability. Uh, At least the market is increasingly perceiving that to be the case. Uh, And, of course, it's the year when we're coming together as a world to try to solve the problem. So in countries where conservative governments, that where the fossil fuel industry has a large voice, Uh, In those countries, they're really fighting for life. They're trying to hold back this tide of change. Uh, But the world as a whole is moving, as we know from those figures of, you know, more renewable energy installed than fossil fuel energy. And many nations, if not most, are determined to broker a lasting solution to this problem at Paris in December uh, of 2015. So the gloves are off now in this fight. Um, We're seeing a, a very stark division. Some of the the, the conservative countries like Canada and Australia are really fighting a rearguard action. Um, how successful that will be is yet to be determined. Uh, but I think we're really, we're reaching the pointy end of the whole political process this year. Now, on the, the question of, of Paris in particular, I mean, there's, there's some debate among activists and, and environmentalists about how much these global treaties matter. Uh, a lot of people were disappointed with the failure in Copenhagen to have uh, anything binding come out of it. You, you seemed a, a bit optimistic about it. On the whole, like, how, how important do you think Paris actually is? Do you think if, if nothing comes out of it, uh, is that the end? Um, do you see it as having a lot of weight or do you think it's part of, uh, you know, maybe uh, 10 or 100 different factors that people should be working on? Well, Paris, in my mind, is very much part of a process. And that process began in 1990, really, with attempts to uh, uh, set a baseline year for the um, the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, at the Copenhagen meeting, the world wasn't ready yet to broker a deal on climate change. There was a lot of goodwill, but we lacked experience and we lacked tools. And I saw that very close up as a chair of the Copenhagen Climate Council. Um, what really saved Copenhagen was the political bravery of one person, uh, President Obama. He uh, walked into a meeting uh, of heads of government of China, India, Mexico, um, Brazil and South Africa 
and came in with essentially a one-page piece of paper with some bullet points on it and said, why don't we proceed this way? Why don't we set our own targets as nations, add them up cumulatively, and see if we can do something about this huge problem? Those nations agreed. The UN as a whole, uh, many nations were outraged that this move had taken place behind their back. But the truth of the matter is that the, you know, the, 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 the negotiations weren't going anywhere. We needed something to break the deadlock. The Copenhagen Accord, which was President Obama's intervention, really did that. And since then, that has been the basis for all international action. Now, it's not legally binding, and we've learned through experience over the last six years that that has both pluses and minuses, but that by far the pluses outweigh the minuses. Um, and the reason that that is the case is that nations who set their own target don't want to be seen to fail uh, uh, jumping over a yardstick or you know a, a hurdle that they have set themselves. So uh, there's a lot of national pride involved in meeting those targets. We're finding that ambitions are slowly being upped that uh, in negotiations and so forth uh, with leaders like China and the US out there urging others on. We're getting a higher level of ambition. So I'm, I'm optimistic for Paris, um, even though it's not going to result in a legally binding agreement. But I do see it just as one uh, step in a very long journey. The, the reason is that um, although they're focused on keeping temperatures below two degrees, there's no agreement on a carbon budget, for example. So we can't say to nations, you have X amount of CO2 to pollute um, before you're over your budget. We, we're not at that point politically, even though we know the science, we have the science in hand that allows us to do that. Um, you know, and as I said, we're coming to this very late. Even if we put the brakes on fully now, using all of the best technologies we have, I can't see how we will um, bring a carbon budget, carbon budget into being by 2030 that keeps us below two degrees or gives us a better than even chance of staying below two degrees. That means a whole lot of other things have to happen. A whole lot of technologies that I call third way technologies. They range from you know carbon negative cement to plastics made from CO2 in the atmosphere uh, to fuels made from CO2 to better forest management, better soil management. All of these things are going to have to come into play to start drawing a gigaton or two of carbon out of the air as they go to give us some breathing space to get back below the two degree threshold and then slowly to improve our position from there. One of the things I found personally in thinking about climate change it's kind of, I've followed it on and off for, for years now, but because it's so slow moving um, and in a way so abstract from our, our day-to-day lives, uh, or it feels abstract, it, it can sort of have this waning capacity. So we care about it on some days and then on other days, it just in the back of our back of our mind. And it seems like that repeats itself on a national or community level as well. Do you, do you see a, a way around that? Or how, how can we get that sense of urgency that um, it, requires if, if we really do need to put the brakes on as, as hard as we can, as soon as we can? Well, I don't know whether we need that sense of urgency the whole time. You know, I suspect even if you were diagnosed with a life-threatening disease, you would still find time to think about other things. That's the nature of the world we live in and the nature of being human. But where you do need a strong focus on climate issues is at election time, when those who are representing you are going to be present at these negotiations and are going to uh, pledge on your behalf certain actions. So for me, it's a political thing. We need to see people more deeply engage with the politics. You know, I don't want it to be top of mind 24-7, but we, we do need to have that focus in a political sense and also in an economic sense. So, you know, when you come to replacing your car or looking at solar panels for the roof of your home or... Um, uh, geothermal heating for your home or whatever it happens to be it's at those moments where you're making a financial decision that will have a climate impact that you need to have it at top of mind as well and to say even though this option might be a tiny bit more expensive up front um, it's worth paying that because in the longer term i'll be better off and the planet will be better off some people have made the point that uh, those type of uh, sort of smaller consumer choices of, of buying more efficient cars or or making our houses better uh, insulated and stuff like that, that 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 won't actually be enough. That in a way, what we need is almost a, a degrowth paradigm where we we have to learn how to 
do with less to to not have to be able to to consume so much and have an economy always growing. What do you think about that idea? Look, I, of course it won't be enough, but without those actions, we're not going to get anywhere. And could I just say that, you know, one of the, the great wins that we've had recently is slowly declining electricity demand in developed countries like Australia and, um, and, and, and no doubt Canada as well. And that's been due to the millions of small consumer choices people have made about buying more efficient refrigerators, putting solar panels on their roof. Um, uh, just being more aware of the energy they use. So, you know, those sort of things, they're really, really important and cumulatively they add up to a lot, but they're not going to solve the problem alone. We need a a price on carbon to start influencing large-scale investment decisions. We need to hasten the uptake of electric vehicles so that we can replace the burning of fossil fuels with uh, transport, uh, you know, uh, from wind and and solar and so forth. Um, Those sort of things have to happen as well. So we need to move together on all fronts. Um, I guess my feeling is that, that, you know, yes, people might despair that perhaps the, the growth paradigm is the the big the big issue and that unless we can stop growing we're going to face a world in collapse but before we get to those really big and daunting issues i i just make the point that what we need to stop growing at the moment is the pollution stream that is what this is all about it's not about um, other things and you could imagine growth in ways that would not threaten the planet i think but that's a discussion perhaps for another day at the moment the issue is let's decouple the economy from the pollution that traditionally has driven it, the carbon pollution that's driven it. Most of the G20 nations have done that. We're hoping to see China uh, follow, India follow, and then the rest of the developing world follow. And if we can do that, we'll have the breathing space or the time required to contemplate those bigger issues about how much growth do we want. Uh, Is it compatible with the long-term sustainability or not? Unless we deal with that problem, we won't have the luxury of even asking that question. I'd be curious to hear a bit about your own journey with your awareness about climate change. I mean, it was it's coming up in a, uh, 10 years ago now that uh, you wrote uh, The Weathermakers, where you really became a public figure in this in this conversation. Um, but when did you first personally become aware of the science and, and start to worry about it? Look, I became aware of climate change probably in the mid 80s, I guess. I was working as a biologist in Papua New Guinea, uh, climbing mountains, doing surveys of alpine environments, uh, particularly looking for mammals that are unique to those environments. And I noticed that on one mountain after the other that I climbed, uh, the tree line was was moving upwards. You could tell the grass was being smothered under these shrubs around, around the margin. And I didn't know what to make of that. And I did a bit of research and realized that it was probably a, an early manifestation of, of the warming trend because the tree line's controlled by a frost frost nights and so forth. So um, that was the beginning, but I didn't really think about it much at the time because I was really focused on the mammals and the mammal survey work I was doing. It was only probably 10 years or so later that um, I took up a job as director of the South Australian Museum in Australia and the Premier of the state asked me to uh, chair and uh, create two boards for him or committees of reference, one on environment and the other on uh, funding, science funding for the state. I did that, but I felt I needed to learn a bit to do that job well. So I went back and read the last two or three years' worth of Nature and Science magazine, trying to identify the key issues. And it didn't take me very long to realise that climate change was the big issue. And for a state like South Australia, on the edge of a desert, where water's a real issue, it was a no-brainer. Climate change was going to be it. So that was my light bulb moment, in a way. I realised that the whole world was wrong at that point. You know, I remember getting up one morning and having a shower, knowing it was 30 degrees or so outside, and thinking, you know, this warm water I'm taking a shower in was made by burning coal 300 kilometres from here, um, piping electricity down to Adelaide, and then um, heating water with it very inefficiently at a time that the sun could do the job for us. You know, what the hell are we doing? So that was kind of the beginning of my personal campaign to decarbonise. I heard you say somewhere that when in this period where you were reading uh, all the scientific literature and learning more about it, um, the sort of odd disconnect of, of walking around knowing that this was a really big thing, but at the time, essentially, no one w- was talking about it. It was the craziest uh, 
a year or a couple of years because I remember walking around my city, my home city, and seeing people I respected and, and loved um, doing the craziest things, you know. People would be just idling their car, just having the engine tick over, just so they could run the air conditioning so their car wouldn't get too hot. You know, and I, I, you could see the fumes coming out of the exhaust pipe. You know, I knew what those fumes were doing. No one else did, you know, or it seemed to me that no one else did. I'm sure there are others out there, but behavior in society as a whole was just, uh, was driven by lack of awareness. And, and that was really, it was that alienation, that sense of craziness that made me think, you know, if intelligent people are doing this, it's due to a lack of understanding. And the only way to dispel that is to really try to write a book explaining how the Earth system works, explaining what's happening with this warming and what we can do about it. And that's how The Weathermakers was born. It took me about five years of research to, to write the book and put it all together. Um, I initially thought perhaps it's only going to be used as a high school text or a university text, um, but it really seemed to t take off. It, it struck a chord. I was really pleased to see um, that once people understood the problem, they had a real willingness to try to do something about it. I was curious how you yourself have been able to deal with writing the line between hope and pessimism on, on this issue, because for myself as a, an observer of it over, over the past few years, I, I feel like I teeter on, on either edge. I either am like, oh, no, we can perhaps do something, or I go to the other end and say, oh, it's hopeless. And I, I've noticed this in a lot of other people, too, when I, I talk to them about climate change. Um, and I'm always impressed in, in interviews uh, I've heard with you. You seem... You seem to be able to ride that, that line um, quite well and, and not go to either extreme. I'm, I'm wondering how you've managed to do that because we had this moment uh, when your book came out and with Al Gore's movie and in 2007, 2008, it seemed like there was all this, this momentum and then it sort of dissipated for a while and maybe we're back in a moment again, I'm not sure, but I, I was wondering just how you yourself managed to, to keep going through those years and, and sort of keep an, an even keel. Well, um... And that's a, that's a good question to ask. And I, I must say that I don't wake up every day um, with a balanced mind and at ease with where we are. I mean, sometimes news really throws me down. Sometimes I read some news and think, yeah, we're starting to win. Um, but I guess in my mind the whole time is, is that, that sense that the coin is still in the air. You know, um, we, we, we haven't yet crossed those thresholds. And combined with that, this sense that we can do something. You know, you, you mentioned that, you know, there was a lot of awareness in 2006, 2007 that seemed to dissipate and go away. I would argue that's not really a, a true reading of the situation and what happened. You know, what, what actually happened over that time was people became aware there was a problem and that, that was a big move. But then some really smart people went away with that knowledge and started developing technologies uh, to address the issue. You know, people like Elon Musk, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, others, you know, w were in that same bo boat. And some governments started to trial programs like a carbon price or an emissions trading scheme that would lead the way for the rest of the world to follow. So while it may have seemed to have disappeared, it was more the case that people were really, really busy dealing with very specific aspects of it. And it took about a decade for that action to bear fruit. A decade on now, we've got the proof in hand. We know a carbon price works. We know emissions trading schemes work to drive down emissions. We know we can generate electricity from clean sources just as cheaply as we can from fossil fuels. Uh, and we're now building up to this second big wave, which is a much more confident wave than we had in 2006, 2007. Uh, this is the wave that's got the fossil fuel industries really scared. And, um, and we have to drive that home to success in Paris, to start on that downwards emissions trajectory, to buy us time, to do everything else we'll need to do over the next few decades. And if that seems like a daunting prospect that this is going to be decades long, um, really people should remember that with that, that process will come enormous opportunity, um, huge opportunities for industries that are barely even thought of now, which will be employing, I think, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people into the future as we start turning waste into product we need and start drawing down that carbon waste and sequestering it uh, for the long-term good of society. So I'm really excited by that, that prospect. There, there won't be a day when we can say we've won. That, that just is not going to happen. This is a process. It's a performance, if you want, by society as a whole. And a poorly choreographed performance, I must admit. But nevertheless, it's a performance and one that 
I'm confident we can bring to a successful conclusion if we play our part now. But just on, on the more personal level, I mean, was that hard in that interim period where it seemed like nothing was happening, where it seemed like we were losing momentum? Um, what I hated uh, in those years between 2005 and 2015 was seeing the figures every year that we are the pollution streams growing year after year after year. That was really tough to live with. I was pretty busy at, at either the international level or the national level trying to do something about that, um, which I guess kept me sane. But I breathed a huge sigh of relief this year when the International Energy Agency brought out their provisional figures uh, for 2014 and made the announcement that emissions growth has stalled. That was just one of those sweet moments in this long performance that you realise, yes, we've got, we, we may create some breathing space for ourselves. So um, I'm waiting to see those figures um, confirmed uh, later in the year and hoping that, in fact, 2015 will show a de decrease. But that's in the lap of the gods at the moment. We, we'll just have to see. Now, as you mentioned, you, you did a lot of work with mammals and, and throughout your scientific work, you've often looked at, at very uh, large timescales. And I was wondering how that impacts your, your thinking of how we as a species relate to, to the planet. I mean, it, especially when you step back that, that far, I imagine it must look um, uh, almost absurd, almost crazy that we happen to be in this particular time, even aside from climate change. Yeah, well, it, it, yes, that's entirely true. Um, I, I am I am trained as a paleontologist, so uh, I'm used to thinking about the millions of years. Um, and I guess it's both good and bad, you know, because we, we know, if you take the long view, that the world goes through crises and extinctions. We know that 99% of species go extinct in the end. And I can see how tenuous humanity's grip is on, or at least civilised humanity's grip is on um, on life, on, on continuance. Um, all of that's true. But I'm also just engaged with an enduring fascination, I guess, with looking at our species. I mean, here we are, you know, an, an upright ape, um, social upright ape, in the middle of forging the first intelligent superorganism that has ever existed in the history of the universe as far as we know. That's a fascinating journey to see us be begin to form this globalised, reactive, unified entity. And, and a lot of my hope for the future is in that, you know, is in, in, in this idea that we can work together as a species uh, in new and innovative ways, that new forms of governance are going to emerge over the coming century, uh, that, that new, um, new ideals, new conventions um, can be brought to bear in a species like ours that haven't really existed or prevailed in the past. So I find that in the long term view really, really fascinating. It feels to me almost as if planet Earth is coming to consciousness or awareness. You can almost see the planet's brain start to form as we as a species start acting in concert in ways that uh, may benefit the planet. And that, that is so fascinating. Um, and along with that, and I don't want to wrap it on too long, but you know what our technologies are giving us is a, a sensory appreciation of the planet that we've never had before. We now have monitors and buoys in the deep oceans telling us of the temperature there. We have a better understanding than ever before about all of the layers of rock between the surface and the Earth's core. We know in exquisite detail what's happening with the atmosphere. So we are plugging in this emerging human brain into a nervous system that's letting us understand the planet's metabolism and the way the planet works and the way its chemistry works. And that is just awesome. It's just fascinating to see that uh, emerge in our lifetimes. I think it's one of the greatest gifts uh, that this generation has. You've also talked about, uh, in sort of that same theme, um, a point I find really interesting, that a lot of the problem stems from the way we conceive of our relationship to, to nature and, and the earth generally. C could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I, yes. Um, we're a very strange species, you know. We, um, we, we began in Africa, you know, 300, 400,000 years ago as a social, warm-blooded, large-bodied, carnivorous species. And there's almost nowhere on the planet that that configuration of assets or attributes uh, could have been fueled. really. It was only in East Africa where the energy was high enough that there was enough food 
to support groups like early hunting humans. We're kind of like lions in a way, you know, social, they're large social carnivores. We're kind of the same, you know, very special circumstances needed to fuel that sort of development. Um, and of course, we've got these, these huge brains that, uh, you know, 2% of our body mass, they take 20% of the energy that we take in. Uh, so I, I, I think um, that long-term view, that, that sense of what we are as, as an entity and what the essence of humanity is, is, is something that we're, we're currently reinventing. And that destructive pathway that we're on that started with us as hunters and then as agriculturalists is slowly giving way to something that's much more akin to the lifestyle of the leaf cutter ants, for example, that live in huge colonies uh, that feed themselves from very carefully cultivated and controlled gardens that don't have a negative impact on the rest of the world outside. And I, I think that's the way humanity is heading. We're, we're starting to uh, move away from that inherently destructive m- way of living that was with us from the beginning into a different worldview. And one of the things that's going to help us a lot with that is access to cheap, abundant, clean energy. Because if you can do that, you can desalinate water. You can control climate in greenhouses cost-effectively. You can grow an abundance of food that in the past would have been unimaginable. Uh, so I think that, the, that, again, we're seeing a sort of a, a historic shift, really, uh, from man the destroyer through to, if you want to use a 70s term, you know, through to a species that's finding its place as the mind and conscious of the planet. You know, I heard you uh, talk elsewhere about how, you know, we become more specialized um, as human, just as civilization has developed. So, you know, we used to all be involved with uh, gathering food or, or securing our food in one way or another. And now through through civilization and through uh, agriculture, it's it's gone to the point where we can have all these uh, various um, specializations. So we we don't actually have to worry about our food or, or our shelter. That's taken care of by by someone else. I was wondering if like you see that as as a cause of this feeling of somewhat alienation from from nature of not having that that visceral connection to it is the fact that we can live in cities and uh, so much of our most of our uh, individual work can be uh, not connected at all uh, to nature, at least at least not directly. Uh, it's a, that's a really interesting question. And I guess I'd have to take a really long-term view of that. Um, when I was working in Papua New Guinea and Erie and Jaya with tribal people, I noticed that they also suffered, many of them, from alienation from nature. Um, the only people that didn't were the sort of nomadic people who lived with the forest and in the forest and went to sleep in the forest every evening. Um, There's very few of them in in Papua New Guinea. Most people are agriculturalists. And um, in the valleys of New Guinea, there's high population densities of Stone Age people, as we think of them, you know, growing very intensively, growing various crops. And once people made the transition from those nomadic people in the forests into um, into agriculture, which happened probably 10,000 years ago, they were already alienated from nature. So the view of the forest from people who were agriculturalists in New Guinea, is really radically different from a view of the forest, a view of the forest of of the hunter-gatherers who live in it, you know, the the nomads who live in it. Um, So I guess we're part of a very long-term, slow alienation uh, from nature where we've created an artificial world around us, whether it be a sweet potato field in the mountains of New Guinea or, or, you know, a suburb in in the middle of Toronto. Um, And I think that's just part of being human and as you say uh, we become very specialized so we don't need to go out anymore and hunt our own food and gather our own food Um, but that started a long time ago too that specialization started 10,000 years ago Um, perhaps the challenge for us now is to ask ourselves you know what is nature Um, how can we re-establish a meaningful connection with the wondrous diversity of our world Uh, in ways that don't damage it. And I think, you know, we will... It's such an interesting process. There's so many aspects to it because, uh, you know, nature is slowly reinvading our suburbs, whether it's coyotes coming back into the middle of LA or wherever, or raccoons or possums in Australia um, coming into the suburbs. Um, the suburbs are incredibly dynamic. Um, species reinvade them, and, and that's where we live. So 
So we, we, we're always learning a new approach uh, to nature. There's also social movements. You know, people um, are making community gardens. They're, re, they're weeding areas of woodland and so forth. These are things that people are, are doing that help reconnect them with nature. Um, and I think they're, they're hugely important. And they're going to grow in future, I think, because people will have a bit more time uh, to, to deal with this. We, if you look at the... the trend in robotization of work you see that you know lots of jobs are going to disappear what will people be occupied with uh you know some of the more positive sides of that may be that we can engage with nature we can give something back to the natural world and and take joy from that deep engagement that we can have with the natural world i was wondering do you think do you think we'll be able to solve the problem of climate change like in a way do you think that it's dependent on getting that that connection with nature and having that sort of consciousness shift? Or do you think it, it, that's just a side issue? Oh, look, I think that we can solve the problem of climate change without everyone having a deep connection to nature. Um, self-interest will win in the end. Um, you know, and, and there's a few questions we all need to ask ourselves about this. You know, do I want to, is the first question would be, do I want to increase my risk of dying of respiratory disease, heart failure or cancer as a result of burning fossil fuels um, or as an increased uh, as a result of burning in, uh, increasingly large bushfires? So that's a simple question that everyone can answer and the answer is no. And the solution is move away from fossil fuels. Do you want to generate your own electricity? Do you want to strengthen your community by having local generation and having jobs in your community rather than in a multinational company in the, the national capital? Again, the answer is most for most people is yes. We know how to do that now. We can move towards, towards doing that. Do we want to be more deeply engaged in the political process to get the right outcome? Some people are standing up and saying, yes, I do. So that doesn't depend on uh, a deep engagement with nature, although many of the people who act may have that. Um, I think self-interest in the end will drive a lot of this. You know, in Australia, I know one of the biggest drivers for the uptake of solar is people are sick of being held hostage by multinational companies for their energy needs. And the option now is put solar panels on your roof and thumb your nose at them, you know. Um, there's a fierce independence in people, I think, which is which is going to play to our benefit when it comes to dealing with this issue. You recently became a father again, um, and you're talking about how sort of that drives it home of of how this does matter. This 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 is a very real thing, even if the worst effects of it will come uh, in a few decades. It really is connected to the here and now. And you made an interesting point of wondering how the young people uh, in a few years of teenagers in a few years from now will conceive of the future, conceive of their relationship to their elders and, and to the world around them if there is no future in a way, if, if we didn't act, if we didn't take the, the action that was required on climate change. And I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about that. Sure. Look, uh, my little bubs is now, he's nearly two years old. Um, you know, he's got a very good chance of being alive in 2100. And if you look at the current trajectory we're on, um, you know, it, the place is going to be an unmitigated disaster by then, with four degrees warmer than it is today. We just can't let that happen. Uh, and a lot of people who are older than, than my son, who are now in their mid-20s, they look at the current situation with disbelief. And they say, you know, can you really justify this catastrophic outcome just because some oligarchs and some multinational companies want to increase their billions of dollars that they make every year is that really what the world's about is that what my world's about um and you know i'm glad to hear them ask those questions because the answer clearly and emphatically is no we need to change we need to change climate change we need to change the power balance we need to change our politics uh, we need to do all of that in order to get onto a more sustainable and fulfilling path so um, the young people get it, and I think that they will deal harshly with us unless we play our part in doing that. Um, they'll either say we're incredibly stupid not to have got it, or we were deluded or self-interested. And um, I, I, I don't want to be judged that way. Uh, I think I want to be part of that change, and I think a lot of people, older people do, uh, even if they struggle with ways uh, to be able to, to actually achieve that. I mean, you've talked about how uh, you grew up with the assumption. I think uh, uh, most of us uh, 
throughout the 20th century did with uh, the assumption that things will only get better. And, and that seems to have mostly disappeared now. Well, I think that was the biggest shock that I had over the last decade talking with young people. Um, it was universally accepted uh, in my generation and probably the one after that things would only get better. I mean, we were fed on comic, you know, cartoons on television, things like Jet Jackson that showed some space age world, you know, and, and, and some uh, much, much better world. Um, and all sorts of science fiction that did reinforce the same message. But so many young people today uh, think the world is just going to get worse. And, and that's the in their gut. That is their sense of the world. And it's a terribly dismaying thing. I mean, I think the last time people felt like that probably was in the late Roman Empire, when you know you, you read of uh, Ovid and others talking about the Golden Age and um, and the fact that this this Golden Age is slipping from our grasp and each generation is getting worse and less competent than the one before it. Uh, I don't want to leave my kids with that sort of legacy. I, I want them to have hope and optimism for the future. And I think they can. But, you know, we need to start winning this battle. We need to start inspiring them with confidence, uh, with practical on-ground experience and with the figures. We need to see that emission stream go down and go down quickly in order to start giving confidence to that generation that we're on a better pathway. Yeah, well, ten off, I mean... Uh, I'd be curious, like through this series, we're going to be to be looking at climate change uh, from uh, a myriad of different perspectives, different stories. It's all around the world, uh, in different communities, on the mi micro level to the macro level. Um, and I was curious, like if if you were outside of the debate somewhat, if you were, you know, that paleontologist or an anthropologist from Mars, uh, following uh, the climate change uh, situation. What sort of stories, what sort of questions are are you most fascinated by? Are you going to be keeping your eye uh, most closely on the, the coming months and years? Wow, that's a really big question. Um, I think as an outsider looking in, I would be looking at the cohesion of our, us as a species. How are we dealing with global issues? And climate change is just one of them. But can we forge agreement on the basis of our fundamental humanity that we need to change our ways in certain things. So that's one big thing I'd be looking at. Uh, the other thing I'd be looking at is intergenerational equity. Um, how do we wrestle power and uh, authority from an older generation that a privileged part of that generation that grew up um, thinking that... Um, what would I say? Well, the digging up fossil fuels was an honourable profession <laughs> and that making billions of dollars was uh, the be-all and end-all of life. Um, so there's some of the really big things I'd be looking at. The other things I'd be looking at are uh, technology. How quickly is it changing? Um, I'd be looking at uh, equality across the globe. Um, where the poorest people on the planet today, where are they going to be sourcing their power from 10, 20 years from now? Um I know they're kind of they may seem to be issues that dance around the edge of climate change, but in some ways they're fundamental to our success or failure. And and what about if you're in the here and now, uh, more specific uh, on the ground debates and fights? Uh, look, I watch watch the numbers. Um, so you know, watch the emission numbers, uh, watch the installation numbers for renewables, watch the costs, uh, look at which companies are prospering and which are not. Um, and try to do something, try to be part of that, even if it's only in a really tiny way, um, because the millions of tinies add up to something really big. You know, one of the arguments in Australia for us not taking action on climate change is people say, oh, we're only one, one and a half percent of the global emissions stream. You know, why should we bother doing anything? Well, we're the 13th largest polluter on the planet. So there's a whole lot of tinies that have to get together and do something. It's true not just of nations, but of people. And if we all do, uh, I, I'm confident we'll get there. We, we will uh, do the best job we can and hopefully by 2050 start seeing that we're getting on top of this problem. And, and just my, my final question, I mean, what about to citizens who are, are really worried about, about this issue? I mean, in some ways it can seem so so meaningless or um our our contribution that we can make can seem quite um trivial or even even abstract especially if we have uh, day jobs that have nothing to do with with climate change or engineering or um education or anything like that um 
what would you just say to to those people who don't quite know how they can fit in with this uh with having making the right moves well i'd i'd say that there's probably few things more corrosive than um feeling helpless uh in a situation where you're deeply worried and the only way of dealing with that really is action is 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 taking action trying to find out how you can do it and then acting on it because with that comes a sense of empowerment and that dispels uh, a lot of that that worry and and you're becoming part of the solution i mean in the longer term it may only be a tiny bit but each one of us is only a tiny bit um, and the world needs us all to do something well uh tim flannery uh it certainly is a, a critical decade and a, and a critical moment uh and uh thanks for thanks so much for joining me today it's been a pleasure thank you